Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined today by longtime friend Jim Warren, a reporter, a columnist, editor, managing editor of the Chicago Tribune, Washington bureau chief of the New York Daily News, as yeah, I recall. Yeah. Uh, so you have huge print experience and TV experience. You've been on various TV talk shows and a student of the media. Much of your writing, especially in recent years, has been about the media, for the media. So we're going to talk about the media, and you're going to explain where we are, how we got where we are, all the implications, business and civic, of the new media landscape. And I was just thinking, you know, how many people do you know who have been paid pundits of CNN, MSNBC, and Fox? That's you? A, a trifecta. That's impressive. Uh, are you even, still being uh, paid I, by any day? No, 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 no. <laughs> but you're huge. No. But you've retired on that. Huge no, they all thing. started getting smart and realized that they didn't have to pay vain, particularly print journalists, to go on at any time of the day or night, and they saved a whole lot of money that way. So there went my uh, my, my my late night screwing around bar money uh, from uh, the three networks. Yeah, that's your, your personal business model. Did yeah, not. yeah, yeah, no. Carly, with their, <laughs> with their business model. So you went into, I mean, we were friends in, in high school, obviously, and, and you went uh, into journalism right from college, and that was, what, 74, 75? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's a cliche that it's changed so much and all. I mean, I guess I'll be devil's advocate. Has it really changed? Maybe people are overstating yeah. it. Maybe it's, you know, there's always changes. Come on, radio, tech, TV. I mean, is it really that big a deal? Is it that big a difference? No, it, it won't be hard uh, fending you off as you play devil's advocate there. Um, okay. and, and in fact, you know, we should, you know, make clear that we were sort of friends from the old neighborhood on the Upper West Side. So it goes way, way beyond, um, Ray predates uh, high school. I mean, we were we, we were like the last of a group of people who spent 13 years at this private school on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And you were like on I know, Riverside and 80th there, or something. 81st. You, joined a, in, you were there from kindergarten. I joined yeah, I was, only right, in fifth grade. Right, so I was, cool. was like... Oh, the, that's right. That's yeah, right. You're yeah. a late, late, late comer. Right. Um, but, you know, just think... When we grew up in the Upper West Side, so this is the 50s and 60s, when it came to just, say, media consumption, what were you talking about? You are talking about a bunch of daily newspapers in New York. My dad had a sort of mid-level job in Wall Street and would come home every day around 4, 4.30 uh, with some, you know, the afternoon edition of a newspaper, the right. New York Post or something like that, the World Telegram and Sun. Um, and then we had a few TV stations. That would have now in the morning, you probably got the evening. New York Times and maybe the Herald Tribune We got or the New York Times right. uh, uh, delivered. Um, and you had a world of, it, it, you know, just a short time ago, there was a world of pre-internet, pre-computers. My high school graduation present was a Smith Corona electric typewriter in a world before computers and cell phones. And before cable news. Before cable news, before no cable news. Before talk radio, before political talk radio, really. Right. Yeah. And so when you talked, for instance, about diversity of opinion in the media, I mean, it was, it was, there really wasn't much. I mean, just consider yourself and sort of the intellectual background you came from. What was there for conservatives on the Upper West Side of Manhattan? There was maybe what the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal. There were was, a few, which didn't become what we think of as the editorial page of the Journal really until the seventies, though. It was one column. Okay. I mean, there were not op-eds. There were not. But, so, but, so just I'm confirming your point. Yeah. There wasn't much. So there was Bill Buckley's National Review once every two weeks, and if maybe a, what which Forbes is, which magazine is, once every two weeks. Right. Then there were monthlies, the was there the national yeah. interest or commentary. But those even were later almost, yeah. So. Oh, later was, how about your dad's, was it a quarterly? The public interest was a quarterly, not founded until 65. So I agree. I mean, if, you, if you're looking at the 50s, late 50s and 60s, it's amazing how little opportunity Newspapers, there was. Um, when, when, when one thinks back to conservative editorial pay, oh, a handful. I right. think the Detroit News, famously the Orange County Register. Right. Bastion of the right wing, Chicago Tribune in the old days, right? Yeah, so there really, there really wasn't much, and I don't, I don't know what you looked at on television. I guess I looked at a little bit of local TV news uh, from one of maybe three stations in New York City. I don't remember watching anything on really PBS. It was ABC, NBC, CBS. It really was quite, quite. And limited. they had twenty-two minutes a day, pretty similar. Pretty homogeneous, mainstream, central liberal, I would say, news. And that was it. 
Uh, no, really, news radio. I think maybe. Right. I think that was in its, ad, and certainly no talk radio. Right. I mean, Rush Limbaugh. For a lot of you know your younger viewers, that's a late 1980s phenomenon, right. and that dramatically changed the the, the media landscape. Uh, so fast forward to today, I mean, when every crackpot, left or right, can have their own site, can have their own blog. I mean, the diversity of opinion is dramatically greater. At the same time, I wonder whether there were any benefits to this, I don't know what you call it, sort of intellectual cohesion, say on the right. Um, what, I mean, the, the parameters of, of debate intellectually were probably pretty narrow. I think like maybe the Wall Street Journal back in those days was for open borders. Uh, Bill Buckley and, 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 and his magazine were sort of against it. But you had nowhere near the sort of right. fervent uh, conversation you had on on a bunch that you have on a bunch of issues today. So it really was different. Uh, economically, um, the the local TV stations were were printing press, and they they just made money. They had fifty sixty percent profit margins in a world in which the broadcast guys controlled everything on television pre cable. Um, most of the newspapers were making a whole lot of money, but you began then, partly because of television, having the decline. So you went from six or seven or eight newspapers in a big market to two or three, but you still didn't have the, the, the revolutionary fall off and the situation you now have where most of them are dead man walking. Uh, you didn't have that in the 60s or 70s. They were still very vibrant or 80s enterprises. Or 90s. They still control classified advertising. With, with big with big newsrooms. And they were really sort of the news. The print guys were sort of the elite. They were sort of the agenda setters. They decided what were the three or four topics that the TV guys would discuss. Um, it's, it's interesting. At the University of Chicago a few months back, um, I, I interviewed Lawrence O'Donnell, the MSNBC host, you know, of clearly liberal bent and a guy who, you know, was involved in that very successful TV show that liberals are getting nostalgic over during the era of Trump, the West Wing, right, right. And Martin Sheen, the president who they mm. sort of sort of wanted. He did a he's done a book on the 68 um, a political a presidential campaign. And when I, the one surprising element of an hour, hour long conversation at the Institute of Politics, which you know well of at the University of Chicago. Um, the one surprising element was when I asked him to compare coverage back then in 68 to, to he makes the claim that it was superior then. <laughs> and I said, well, that's kind of weird because, I mean, today, you co president, I mean, every stop, there's a reporter on, there's a reporter giving you live video. Real time, tweet, Five Twitter, appearances yeah. by Hillary Clinton, mm -hmm. six by Trump. You're getting every single thing from the scene. You don't have to wait till the day after. He makes the case that things back in 68 were far more thoughtful, far more contemplative, precisely because the reporter didn't have to instantly send something out. He or she, it was mostly he, had you know five, six, seven hours to make sense of these five or six appearances by you know the candidates back then, as opposed to now. That was a that's a bit of a surprise. I'm not sure I totally agree because I think in some ways political realm possibly, this is, a, 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 I think, an amazing golden age of at least the quantity of coverage. And it, it's it's not just covering the day-to-day -day events, but it's the ability to quantify things, to give you statistical data. I mean, if you want to know about some congressional race going on in Peoria or something, you don't have to have someone fax you stories. You can right. just find out instantly what's going on. You can get all the demographic data from the district. It is pretty amazing. And, and one has it, I think, in a lot of other areas, sports. I mean, I just, uh, this time for the Winter Olympics uh, in South Korea, I mean, you could watch every single event on some platform if you're interested. You wanted to watch the great U.S. curling team? You could watch every single time they did, as opposed to in our day where there wasn't even same day coverage. Right. ABC would have to take film, send it to London, mm -hmm. send it to New York, and then show it to us, and sometimes proudly say, we have same day coverage of the figure skating. Right. So the technology um, 
which was sort of kind of a little bit of a toy back then, now really, I think often for the better, drives a lot of what the media does. I mean, that's a double-edged sword, and we can talk about yeah, we that, should talk that about later. It. I mean, I'm struck, I was, when I speak on campus, sorry, 10 years ago when I was, I'd say, more pro the current situation, because I thought the internet had really opened things up for people, including young people. When I spoke on college campus, I would make the point that when I was at, in college, and we were in college at the same time, uh, you didn't have access. I mean, people now take it for granted. Well, if I'm a smart conservative kid, I'll go online and see what did Charles Krauthammer say? What did uh, the Weekly Standard say? What did National Review say? The Journal editorial page, oh, there's an interesting distinction here in their thoughts on what happened yesterday. None of that was available to us. I mean, you had the local paper or papers, in my case in Boston, I guess the Globe and the Herald. You had the national TV news, which was pretty homogenous. And that was literally it. And, and so you couldn't even, and there were, colonists began in the mid-70s, Sapphires, I think George Will, 73, 74. But you couldn't necessarily get them. It wasn't like every newspaper showed up in Boston. Maybe a day late, you could get stuff. Right. You know? And you had to make a pretty special effort to get the Washington Post in Boston. So, and then the columns were syndicated, so maybe you'd see them three days later, you know, depending on the paper's schedules. Uh, not all papers had much in the way of op-ed pages. I mean, the degree to which everyone has access to intelligent reporting and commentary today is extraordinary, and the degree to which people have access to unintelligent yeah, reporting I, and commentary I, I, is also I, extraordinary. And I guess, well, so let's talk about that. And then I, I, for me, the big break is probably sort of what mid, internet itself is a big deal, but, but then social media sort of takes it all to, and, and talk radio was a big deal, and cable news was a big deal. All of those, I think, were big deals within a certain context. I do think, don't you think, that the something happened, though, ten year, five, ten years ago with social media that takes it to a whole different level. Yeah, and, and, and it also changed sort of our relationship to news. I, Without getting you know, too nostalgic and without sort of trading in certain mythologies, I, had a, I, I sort of remember consuming news was some of a sense of it being a civic duty now for so many it's kind of more a little bit more entertainment and that's a real that's a real challenge for a lot of folks particularly in an era where say advertising rates may somehow be tied to how many eyeballs how many people looked at that story so you know you want to kind of juice up that headline a little bit more you want to get out those bulletins as as quick as you can there was a recent day i looked at the face of my iphone there must have been 20 bulletins about Jared Kushner's, uh, uh, you know, security classification being, you know, right. uh, changed. It was all the same story. And one was more overheated than the next. And in a couple of cases, there was some you could sense from some of the media outlets. There was a, some vague sense of vindication. Aha, Jared Kushner is, right. is, is got his. So the quantity of stuff that we have access to at a given moment is quite astonishing. Um, I mean, if you want to take time out now and just go online and see what they're saying in Johannesburg about something, it doesn't even have to be a big national thing, it'd be some local crime story in Johannesburg, you can find out. Yeah. Um, but why is it, I wonder, that we don't necessarily feel that much more informed or we feel a, a little sort of confused? I mean, I live on this tree-lined block of single-family homes on the north side of Chicago, a lot of upscale professionals. Uh, there are a bunch of you know, seven-figure homes, new and old, on the block. There are Harvard lawyers and Yale-trained neurosurgeons and stuff. Virtually nobody gets a newspaper delivered anymore. And all due respect to my, in some cases, Ivy-educated uh, friends, um, their hold on what's going on, even just locally, is often tenuous. And I think it has something to do with just being bombarded, not having the time to sort of focus on a particular thing. Uh, it's got something to do with our being entranced with news as entertainment and the models of so many, even some of the elite media has has changed, I mean, in, in, in some ways. the. The Washington Post is a fascinating example. Its success has something to do with world's richest man coming in to save them, it has something to do with the ability to hire great reporters. It also has something to do with technology and their ability to get more and more people into the tent by being at least responsibly provocative, but provocative. And also by swapping the 
local papers, right, and the smaller competitors. I mean, so let's talk about the, the business side of it a little, <coughs> then we'll get to the yeah. civic stuff, which is uh, <coughs> something I'm more interested in, but you've studied the business side. So newspapers, I mean, that consolidation and, and diminishing of numbers continues? Yeah, uh, it continues. So, um, and the swamping of the local papers in particular? New York Times, even in, in the midst there, uh, relatively astonishing revival and the fact that they have now two million digital subscribers, which is quite remarkable. And there's, there's somewhere in the mix is some sort of Trump effect. Uh, but, you know, as a, it was recently as 10 or 12 years ago, their revenues were around three billion a year. They're at half of that now. Is that right? Yes. Despite and, the fact that they have right. more people reading right. any particular article right. in the New York Times than was once the case. But take a look. I live in Chicago. I pay $1,000 for my print subscription. If I, if I cancel that tomorrow uh, and just go to a digital only, which wouldn't be stupid because there's a lot more content on the digital uh, platform, um, I think they charge me anywhere from, the, depending on the type of subscription, 150 to 200. Washington Post is significantly even cheaper because it's sort of the Bezos, Amazon model, get larger numbers in for cheaper. But that, even though their total audience, New York Times, has, has increased dramatically, the loss of those print subscribers, A, but more important, the loss of the print advertisers is something they've not come even close to uh, to making up. So when we were kids and opened up the New York Times, you might see the full page ad for Bloomingdale's. Yeah. Maybe they paid thirty, forty thousand dollars for that. Now if Bloomingdale's wants an ad on the digital version, it's a pittance. Right. Uh, it's it's it, it's it's an absolute pittance. And classified so, ads which were a huge profit center for every paper because you it was the only I, we moved to Washington. How do we find a place to live in Washington? We oh, had to buy the Sunday Washington thing. Post and look at the classifieds. I mean that's totally gone obviously and that was hugely profitable because what were they doing? They were taking copy you sent them looking or you know, looking for an apartment, looking for to buy this, looking for a job and they were just reproducing <laughs> it and then charging you, right? Yeah. So the they the lost classified advertising and then some of the mainstays, uh car advertising. Display advertising, yeah. Display advertising sort of went at the same time. Yeah. Um, so now you have a situation in which say So what's the future of the papers? So I mean Well I think few the, I think the print versions it. the print versions are it's just a matter of when most of them cease. Really? The New York Times CEO, very smart guy, British guy, um, he gives the Times, in some interviews, he, he talks about maybe another 10 years for the print really? edition of the New York Times, maybe another 10 years. But that may be kind of rosy. Say you're the San Francisco Chronicle. 30 years ago, uh, 1988, you had 670,000 subscribers. I think now you've got about 160. Wow. In a giant, booming, affluent market. Um, if you're the San Jose Mercury, which used to have a newsroom of three or 400, you have a newsroom now of about 50, covering Silicon Valley, yeah. which gets us into other issues about the business models imploding and thus not having the money to pay journalists to cover significant areas. Um, uh, the Chicago Tribune, which I worked for for 23, 24 years, uh, when I left there as managing editor, we had about 650 people in the newsroom. When was that? Now, uh, in 2008, 10 years ago, 10 years ago. Uh, now maybe it's three, 350. Oh. We had about $750 million a year in revenues in, in uh, 2007. Imagine this. In 2000, beginning of 2008, and we had made very, very conservative budget projections for 2008, very conservative. Um, the, the guys who ran the company were sort of Midwest penny-pinching guys, you know. Um, but come March, we started realizing that we were missing our weekly pro uh, projected revenues by seven figures, a million dollars a week we were coming short. That had a bunch of something to do with the recession that was, was coming, but also had to do with technological change and an internet, which we, in our case, we were too far in front of six, seven, eight years earlier. It was us and the uh, Raleigh News and Observer were sort of in the forefront. But then that was a world of dial-up connections. We were spending a lot of money, and then we started losing money, so we cut back, and by the time we realized that the world had changed, it was sort of too late. Then making like everybody else, 
the, uh, the, the, the crazy strategic decision to give away our content for free on our websites. And by the time the newspapers woke up and said, boy, this is kind of stupid, because then people don't have to go buy the paper, they just get it for free. By the time we decide to start charging people maybe after 10 free articles a month or something like that, for most, for most of us it was, it was too late. So I think um, you're gonna see the print versions in almost all these markets go, and the question's gonna be, can, will our children and grandchildren be willing to pay something for digital content? And can we figure out ways to get enough revenue in to pay people money to actually do things? Um, anecdote which I refreshed yesterday, about seven, eight years, six years ago, I gave a speech at the University of Chicago, the Harris School of Public Policy, and for the speech, I wanted to make big points about decreasing government coverage. And so I called the guy who was head of the Springfield, which is the capital of Illinois, Springfield Reporters Association or something. I said, how many people full-time are covering the state legislature? Uh, notoriously as, Corrupt, right. <laughs> yes, as ethically challenged as any legislature in America. Uh, they make the folks here on Capitol Hill look like you know, they're out of some convent uh, and righteous. Um, and I was shocked to learn that they were down to 24 full-time journalists from 32 only a year or two before, that even a paper as big as the Rockford paper, second biggest city in the state, uh, had just no longer covered the state legislature full-time. Last week, I checked in to update the figure. They're down to three. Is that right? Three full-time reporters covering a legislature where the real skullduggery plays out, where like money and may where be passed. billions of dollars are appropriated, and oh so yeah, forth. yeah, it's a serious, yeah, big state, Illinois, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, how that's going to change, I don't know, but but that that that's sort of one sort of window onto changing business model because all the papers are the Chicago Sun Times, another uh, paper that I worked for for seven or eight years. Um, they're losing a couple million dollars a year. Uh, I mean, online advertising has turned out to be kind of a disaster in the sense that you well, just can't make money off it. Google makes money off it, and Facebook makes money off it, but normal newspapers yeah, and magazines. Yeah, in most of these so markets, I don't know what it's like, Weekly Standard, but in, in, in most of the local markets, and it's the same whether you're in Albuquerque or Houston or Seattle or Chicago, all that advertising, it used to be the sole province, basically a monopoly of the newspapers, the TV stations, the radio stations, now 80% of it, 80% goes to Facebook and Google. Yeah, yeah, they have 80% of the online advertising in the country, I think. Yeah. yeah. Those two. So. And it's more efficient if you can advertise on Google against, if you're a hotel, you advertise against searches for hotel in Chicago, oh. hotel in the north side of Chicago, boutique hotel in Chicago. Or, That's more efficient than buying generic ad on the Chicago Tribune site. Or. Right? 30-somethings interested in hotel in Chicago. Wow. And then at the Facebook level, you get to targeting oh, people yeah. who have searched for, yeah. or have to, in Google have mentioned Chicago, the word Chicago and hotel. You can buy the ad that pops up, right? So that's a hugely more efficient way of targeting. It's astonishing. Targeting. So, you know, a lot of people have focused on the revival of the Washington Post and New York Times. And in fact, I've, I've written about it. And it is genuine revival in both cases for, for different reasons. In one case, you've got the world's richest guy. Another case, you have this astonishing family, now in the fifth generation, 37-year-old, I think, new publisher. And they have no other revenue source, just the paper. And, and they're, gonna, they're gonna go down with the ship if they have to. I mean, they're gonna still, they have, a newsroom of 1,300 people, 1,300. That's as big as they've ever been. Uh, the Washington Post, which is often considered in tandem, is like 750. And I would argue, all due respect to all our friends at the Washington Post, those products are still very, very different. I mean, the breadth of the times can't be matched by the Post. The Post has done a fabulous job, and Bezos has brought a lot of technological aplomb for every big shot reporter they've hired the Post unseen by the world is maybe one or two really smart engineers who they've hired, which make things like the load factors, you know, how quickly you can get a story from the post, like it's far better, website. far better yeah, yeah. Than, than any other papers. But with the, the focus on the, the Times and the Post forgotten is that 
a lot of the, all the rest of the industry, the newspaper part of it is dying, and it's unclear what comes instead, uh, what 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 comes in its place. I ran for two and a half years. There was on my r resume, which I got to update one of these days. I, I, when my next to my resume, I got to include a two and a half year period in which I helped run a nonprofit in Chicago, media nonprofit called the Chicago News Cooperative, and we were unusual because. We cut a deal with the New York Times. Bill Keller was the editor at the time. We became, for the first time in the New York Times history, they contracted out to people not on their staff to do journalism for them on a regular basis. Back then and even now, they had been uh, afflicted with a problem of figuring out how to cheaply cover local news. Because everybody had always told them in their surveys for years and years, oh, we love the New York Times for national coverage, foreign coverage, but I wish you had a little bit more about my town. And they couldn't figure out a way to do that uh, with, with a moderate expense. So then here come these old fart newspaper guys who are from a similar tradition starting a nonprofit. So they cut a deal with us. So by twice a week in the Midwest print edition, whether you were in Peoria or Chicago, there were two pages of Chicago news right in front of the editorial page and the op-ed pages. So what in every other edition would be two pages of national news was two pages of Chicago news. I actually was so for two and a half years. I could claim I was a New York Times columnist because I was the columnist on the two days we, we ran stuff. So that went well for about two and a half years until we ran out of money. Now, by that time, the Times had replicated our seeming success in San Francisco and Texas, but as we speak today, all gone, all, all, all dead. And on these local levels, I'm not sure what it's like in, say, northern Virginia where, where you are, but in, the, in these big metropolitan areas, there's, there, it's unclear what comes, what, what there is. Now, I guess the question is, I mean, A, could the, some of the online news providers become more like colleges and universities and museums with, you know, wealthy yeah. individuals, institutions backing them. It's not a for-profit model. It's more of a, you know, not-for-profit model. But you can, of course, have excellent museums that don't make up, make a third of their money is from charging people for entrance, and most of the money is donations and, you know, philanthropic backers. That would be one question. And people talk about that a lot. I'm not sure it's really happening that much. And the other thing, I guess, is, you know, so in Northern Virginia, if you want local news, there are actually pretty good websites that have the local crimes, the local yeah. sports, and maybe that's fine, and maybe people are learning as much as they ever did. Though I sort of take your point about the state capitals and the local and state government. It's one thing to report on, you know, Langley High School beat McLean in football last Friday. That's kind of fun. Right. And there's a market for that. Do people want care about the Fairfax County uh, Board and how much you know, some decisions they've made and, and probably have someone cover that intelligently you know, football, anyone who's a sports fan at some level can go look at the game and say, you know, this is... But to be intelligent coverage, you'd have to know some history, you'd have to know what's really going on, what the real, why this person's voting this way. And so you're right, I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent in Fairfax County, and I don't know, do we have any coverage to speak of of, of that? I mean, that's a Yeah, good there question, was uh, you know? recently uh, much attention given to um, the Potter familias of the Ricketts family, uh, you know, the big Omaha wealthy family that started the big insurance, was what, E-Trade, I think. Well, E-Trade, well, yeah, which is the stock worker, I think, the yeah. online. And, and right. Yeah. And uh, the father, who's, uh, you know, who's, who's got a son who's, I think, the governor yeah, of Rickett Nebraska. The father, then, the there's, then there's a son who runs the Chicago Cubs. Right. Then there's... Huge victory last year for them. Then there's know. another son who's a he's now, he's bicycle a, shop owner in the north suburbs of Chicago who briefly was a, a Trump selection for Commerce Department. Right, or and now he's RNC now Finance he's, Chairman. Now yeah, RNC yeah. Finance Chairman. I don't know the family. Yeah, so. yeah. He, the best connected bicycle shop owner, <laughs> suburban bicycle shop owner you ever met. And then interestingly enough, there's um, gay daughter, big Democrat, right. uh, part of the family. But the dad... Uh, started, I think, out of the best of motives, a local news service, I think mostly in New York and Chicago, called DNA Info. And there was a lot of publicity given a few months back to his deciding seemingly uh, very arbitrarily one day to close close it all up. And it was mostly covered as if it was a, a, a simply an attempt by him to subvert a unionizing attempt right. in New York. That was part of it. But it was also because he was losing tons of money. He couldn't figure out how to do it. And they were doing very good work in New York and Chicago. They were, you know, breaking lots of 
nice little stories, but they still hadn't figured a way to get enough people to actually pay for the content. And so uh, with those gone, you know, you're left in some neighborhoods like, you know, just well-intentioned bloggers. There's a woman in Brooklyn who broke big stories about Paul Manafort because she goes around her, in Carroll Gardens, I think, in the neighborhood. She goes around with her camera taking pictures of weird stuff going on in the neighborhood. And, and, and on one block, people were pissed off at this, this townhouse that had been sort of under renovation on and off, and it was a big eyesore, and she checks into it, and who owns it? And where did the money come from? Mm. Well, it was Manafort and apparently the Ukraine. Mm. So would you believe a well-intentioned non-journalist blogger in Brooklyn breaks a big story? But, you know, I don't think that's the model that's going to uh, uh, save uh, American democracy or w what, what to me is ultimately a, a, a real concern out of all this, which was, it seems, again, without being too nostalgic, sort of a it's almost decline in civic engagement that has something to do with, I think, something to do with the lack of consistent reporting on what's going on in these communities, not just governmental, but uh, other things too. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, Rahm Emanuel, the, you know, cantankerous, uh, you know, strong-willed mayor of Chicago was taken to a runoff by a rank mediocrity. And, you know, it, it didn't get any more dramatic than that. He had spent millions and millions and millions of dollars against a guy who had a few bucks from the unions and that was it. And I think the final turnout was like 32%. I mean, I suppose the, the anti-nostalgia point of view, you know, a lot of these local papers were kind of corrupt. They were in bed with oh my politicians. Gosh. Yes. So, you know, it, it is a mixed, a little bit of a mixed bag. But I, it can't be good for the country to have almost no coverage of local and state government, I guess. is that. Uh, do you think the local and state issue is more serious a problem than the oh, yeah. national issue? And oh, yeah. It gets yeah. less attention, of course. Oh, but just, look, just think of yourself. Just think of the Weekly Standard and the and uh, probably the pretty aggressive com competition you have just totally. in sort of one area. Yeah. And look at the job you guys do on more national things and look at the job that the thousands of reporters do here covering uh, Congress. I don't think there's any comparison between the quality of coverage today, the quantity of coverage of Capitol Hill and the agencies compared to 20, 30 years ago. There's just more of it. I mean, there is very little that gets passed in Congress, provision snuck in, that at some point doesn't come out, and then someone's cross-checking with the files about campaign contributions, right. and right or wrong, linking, you know, and figuring out that Congressman X put this thing in, and it actually involves a bridge in the, in the dis whatever. Um, the quality of stuff now, I mean, Politico, you go up to the hill, it's like crack cocaine right. for these 20-somethings. Oh, what, what, what's Politico saying now? Right. And we can all jest in some ways or derisively look at some of what seems occasionally to be the over, overheated acclaim of some big exclusive or some big breaking news. But compared to what? Compared to 30, 40 years ago, well, say when you were, in, when you were working for Quayle or then working for Bennett, what was it like? You woke up in the morning looking at the Post and the yeah. Times? So I would say the only counter argument after that is that I think there's, there's a lot of coverage and it, it has a slight, and it, a lot of it's good. And anything, as you say, big-ish, you know, main Congress, I think, gets more coverage. So I was, I was at the Education Department. The Washington Post had a reporter who was assigned, as I recall, to maybe two or three second-tier agencies, like labor, education, or something. And she, you know, I got to know her a little since I was Ben's chief of staff, and we had an interest in what the Post said, and she had an interest in covering us, and so she didn't just take press releases. She wanted to meet people who were senior, you know, people in the, in the Bennett Education Department. And we didn't get in the Post. I can't imagine there was more than one article every two weeks about education. But she knew, I mean, she really, she had the leisure to study education policy a little, not just to have lunch with me, but to go talk to people at Brookings and AEI and the education lobbyists on both sides. And well, what is, what is really going on with the college loan program? And you would get a kind of informed coverage of fairly in the weeds, bureaucratic things, you might say, which I'm not sure you do get. I guess one problem with the kind of herd-like coverage now, they're all on the, you told her people covering the gun, gun rights on the Hill because there's a huge legislative fight and Trump just weighed in and will you know, what this happened. Maybe fewer people covering 
you know, the student loan program or, or, or covering it less, or they're assigned to do it for two months and then they move on, to, or they, they kind of dip in if it's a controversy, controversy and then dip out. So that would be the one, I'd say, flip side of that, where I think there was once better coverage of the more routine aspects of now, government. But having said that, I sort of tend to agree with you. Washington is pretty well covered in general and major international issues are pretty well covered. And if you want to find out the debate on U.S. policy towards Putin, obviously, or towards Syria, it's not like you can't, f and you have access to foreign papers, and you have access to yeah, my specialty magazines, and you can read foreign policy, or, the, you know, you don't just have the Post to depend on or the Times. My eighth grader goes to a uh, private school, south side of Chicago, run by the University of Chicago, and he had a paper the other day that he was on ISIS. Uh, he was doing something on social media and ISIS. Now I was trying to think back when yeah, we were we, kids. Yeah. What would we had? What would our sources have been? I I I could remember myself going to the public library right, on the Upper up. East Side when we moved to Upper East Side on York Avenue, or maybe going downtown on Fifty Something near the main branch of public library. There was a research facility. I went there and looked at books. You know, maybe micro was there microfilm? Yeah, you could look in the ma yearly index of magazine articles, but again, it wouldn't really be quite up to date, and you would read some article from five months ago in Foreign Affairs, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. he has access, partly through Google, to stories. He found a story in Wired magazine that I'd never seen on ISIS's use of social media. Yeah. That was a very sophisticated take, far, far more than I had yeah. known. Uh, uh, about them, so you know that's a um, that sort of gets to the, the notion of a far larger quantity of sophisticated stuff, and then you know the internet gives everybody, whether it's even Brookings Institution or AEI, a chance to you know do but put up big papers out there and make those available, right. and you know now everybody is you know social media conscious, so they're trying to you know come up with little sexier ways to do things. Which, in and of itself, is maybe if you know, you, if you look at the glass half full, it might be a double-edged sword. Because if you think of it, back in the day, long time ago, the editor of the magazine or the newspaper really was driven by anecdote as to what people were looking at. It should also be said that at least in newspaper, daily newspapers, they always lied to advertisers about what people looked at. So I said, oh, this column at Crystal, oh, they're really popular. Yeah. Our survey show. You want to show. buy the ad next to it, right? Yeah, right. You, you're right. right. And, and it's going to cost you twice as much. That thing back in the back section, oh, that's not so popular. Yeah. Uh, fast forward to today, they can't lie. Right. Because the, the advertisers also have their own data. So they know. They know that that column that you are so proud of writing, you know, 28 people looked at. Right. You know it. And half of them didn't go to the second page. Right. Half from the first page. Exactly. <laughs> so, and, and you could answer this better than I could. The pressures at place, the, pleas the, pr the, the pressures placed on an editor, yeah. whether it's TV editor or radio editor or newspaper editor or magazine editor or just a, a digital only operation, of that data are significant. I mean, having been owned by two wealthy and generous billionaires who I think felt a sense of public spirit and supporting the <laughs> weekly standard. We have several million dollars of revenue, but we don't quite make up the gap between that and expenses. I was able, and still we, we still have the case of the standard, that we don't put on our website most read, most emailed, and so forth, which the Times and everyone else has basically done for over a decade. I and mean, this is already an old debate, pre-social media almost. And I didn't do it because I just thought, you know, it is in a, we're making a judgment every week. This is still in the old days where the print is dominant, the, the, the weekly issue as opposed to the website. But the same argument would be mostly true of the website. We're making a judgment that this stuff is worth publishing. And I don't want to be in the business of, and that's, we're giving you what we think is important. Obviously, we know that fewer people read a book review about the ancient world than read a jazzy, you know, a Fred Barnes piece about a huge controversy in, in a presidential campaign. But we want to pres preserve the, you know, not just the image, but I mean the message that we think, you know, people should be where they want, it's a free country, but we hope you'll read all this and take a look at all this. And I thought it was very bad, very bad psychological and incentives and sort of sends a very bad message for people to see on your own website, this one was read by 32,000 people and this one was read by 7,000 and this is the most emailed. And I do think it's had a huge effect, but when I said we're not doing it, and I've said this many times, and I also said we're not gonna have comments, in each case, I was told correctly by our business people, fine. I mean, 
but you're sacrificing about 25% extra uh, readership and pop because people love that and you'll get you know and I said fine I just we're, we're, we'll make well then our to our owner's credit they were willing to take that hit you know to the degree we're not a big thing but I think the pressures on the Times and the Post and the big political and the people who are more in the business of you know they need to show don't you think the pressures there are just very great to, and that has all kinds of effects on the reporters and on the columnists oh my gosh. and on the tone and on you know I took. Um a job as I think you alluded to as bureau chief in Washington for the New York Daily News. My first day was Obama's second inaugural day. And my first trek up to the New York Daily News office, uh, which is now way, way, way southern tip of Manhattan, the first thing that hit me when I walked in the newsroom, giant screens like tote boards, like, you know, I don't know, you know, like Pat Sajak has or other game hosts. But second-by-second second, uh, accounting of how stories were doing online. And there it was. The, and and it, it's, it's, it's part, it becomes part of the ethos. And reporters inevitably are looking to see how their story's doing. And they see... And they think they'll be compensated accordingly to right? some degree, which is true, of course. And then they see the story about the Kim Kardashian is like going gangbusters and that... Uh, you know, very honorable piece they did on uh, something at the city council is like number 15. And, you know, that's, there's, there's the double-edged sword. Same thing at the Washington Post. Washington Post, all over that newsroom, is not just data on what people are looking at, is dat data on load times, is data on how f far into stories people, they've got That's everything. Sticky people, yeah. Now, what do you- Two different, well, now these days you can put up a piece with different titles. Uh, different headlines, and or even different leads or different picked photos, and quickly test which is getting oh. the most pickup, and then adjust accordingly. Which in a way isn't bad. I mean, if they're all legitimate photos, I mean, why shouldn't you test and do the one that people are most interested in? I guess. But of course, it has a certain tendency to mean that you're not going to have. Yeah. You're going to use the most. I find this even in the Weekly Standard. You're going to, for online purposes, you're going to use the most famous person in a photo or in a headline. You're going to use Trump. Even if it's not really a story about Trump, it's a story about, exactly. I don't know, his labor department doing something. <laughs> he doesn't even know what's happening. You know what I mean? But Trump's labor department announces X. will get a lot more readership than the labor department announces X, you know? So anyway. The yeah. guy who lives across the street from me in Chicago is 36, 37-year-old CFO of basically what's sort of a clickbait firm. Uh, his boss is 29 or 30 years old. Um, and as he was homeschooled in LaPorte, Indiana. At age 12, he gets up the nerve to contact J.K. Rowling. And he asked J.K. Rowling, Harry Potter fame, um, about can he, would she, would, would she give him approval to do a, a Harry Potter fan website? And at age 12. Even the contacting of J.K. Rowling is itself a modern yeah. phenomenon of the internet, presumably, right? I right, mean, so, he, so he contacts her, she says fine, he's off to the races, he's now a wizened maybe 29, profiled in the New Yorker magazine as the king of clickbait. He has, in downtown Chicago, a couple of long rows of, of wood tables, and they've got these computer engineers, and they crank out algorithms, which media companies and corporations buy, which do exactly, in part, what you're talking about, put on three, five, four, five, six, seven different headlines on the same sort of content, and immediately we know within minute, two minutes, three minutes what's what's working. And uh, local, for instance, a lot of local TV stations hire them. You know, you may see those things at the bottom. Uh, you know, uh, who's got the the NBA star with the best abs or the, mm. the celebrity with the best blah blah blah. They're they're masters of trying to gin up um, a readership. Now, you can certainly argue that whether you're the Weekly Standard or your Vice or something, getting as many people into the tent right. to see your quality stuff, that's, that's right. pretty honorable. And headline writers, even in our day, weren't inattentive. So gee, let's have a no. jazzier headline, not a super, you know, not a boring headline. So yeah. you could argue that's more of the same, more sophisticatedly done. But let's, so, well, go ahead, but then I yeah, want no, to no. move to social uh, media, which strikes me as a whole different level of kind of... Yeah. Only know. thing I was going to say, I, for the last few years, I've done a, um, a newsletter on, uh, on media, 
And one day, and I was getting a lot. Of, I was getting some grief initially from my employer about the length of my items. Oh, it was too long, and I was told, you know, on iPhones, oh, these are things are too long. You want to be nice, short, and snappy. So I called up um, Marty Barron, the editor, the famous editor of the Washington Post. Maybe a lot of Americans first sort of encountered with the Academy Award-winning movie about uh, ethical disarray in the in the Roman Catholic Church Diocese of, of Boston. He was then the editor, he was of, the editor of the Boston Globe. Yeah. And uh, so I call him and said, uh, listen, you guys are masters of newsletters. You do a thousand newsletters. They're really good and they're on cooking and they're on politics and they're on this and that, on travel. Um, <laughs> can you tell me about what all these smart guys from Amazon, who now essentially own you, uh, what do they tell you about length of newsletters? And there was this pause, and I thought I had, the line had gone. I said, Marty? He goes, yeah. I guess, what, what, do they, what do they tell you about length? And he goes, I don't understand the question. Uh, I said, what, Marty, what do they tell you about length? <coughs> and he says, nothing. They tell, talk to me about headlines and images. Hmm. That was very revealing to me. And it's something that he admits he's way, way, way more, more conscious of. Now, they have not, you know, undermined the integrity of their editorial content, but they have become way more, I think, intentionally provocative in how they try to get stuff out. And in a given day, if you look at them and the New York Times, there's a certain sort of, I would argue, a reserve still, still with the New York Times. That one doesn't quite see with the Post, but is that so bad to figure out ways to get people no. to look at that? Uh, that trade story, the Trump trade story that they probably would have just sort of rolled their eyes about to begin with, an important subject, that's 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 fine by me. As we speak here, it's yes, the beginning of March, it's a big story. Yeah, yeah. The, um, no, I would say, in the con so again, the contrary argument is you get this initial blush of everything's gotta be short every when we started these conversations. Uh, when I started, you know, about, about three years ago, People said, yeah, you know, no one's going to listen to an hour and 20 minutes, and uh, you need to five, 10 minutes. That's what people want. And people do want that, and there are many <coughs> successful internet uh, programs of different kinds that are short. But actually, there's also, it turns out, a conversely, a market for the longer form. And I'd say the same is true of print, incidentally. One of the great things about the internet is a, print, a long print piece, which in the old days might have been too long for people to read within a week or two, and then there's a new Weekly Standard or a New Yorker, and it goes in some pile somewhere and doesn't. Now it can, these things can have second and third lives, because it turns out you did a profile of someone, well, you mentioned this fellow who's going to now get some new, the piece on the New Yorker piece on the clickbait guy, and it's now going to get some new readership when people see this, and they say, oh, I'll, 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 Google, I'll search for that. So there is a, these things are somewhat, I mean, I could argue that a lot of intelligent pieces get much higher levels of consumption than in the old days when, unless you were the per kind of person who saved an old commentary magazine or, you know, went to the library oh. to look it up, you couldn't, you know, just go Google and say, oh, that was a good piece. Well, your piece on ISIS and the, uh, your son, or the son's piece on ISIS and the, uh, yeah. uh, and Al-Qaeda, whatever it was, uh, I mean, ISIS and social media, that was published months ago, right? And so. throw in, and I'm sure the Weekly Standard exploits this too, throw in the uh, much more imaginative and, and sort of robust use of images right. and graphics and data. So you're not s sending a guy to cover, a photographer to cover a story with your reporter, and then you've got room for one kind of black and white, maybe two color photos. Of. Right. Now, I mean, you can have 20, 25. You can have video, well edited. Um, when there was the... Um, the floods in uh, you know in, in Houston, then in Florida. I talked to the video guy, who heads a sixty or seventy person video unit at the Washington Post. They turned out a thousand separate videos of of all of all that of all that flooding for various different platforms, shot and and particularly edited differently for multiple platforms. Type certain videos work on Snapshot, certain work on Instagram, certain work on the Washington, better on Washington Post website. They have 70 people working on video, and I think that's been that's a godsend. I mean, yeah. there were there was there was nothing akin to that. So I think that's why about 10 years ago, I think I mentioned this, uh, started to mention this before when I spoke on campuses. Whatever, I would say it's a double-edged sword. You got to realize what you've lost. Coverage of state capitals got to also recognize what we've gained. Everyone can read competing views on something 
in real time, not two weeks later. Uh, intelligent access to huge amounts of information and and articles keeping alive, uh, even if they're a year old or ten years old or fifty years old, obviously. Um, I guess so. I was mildly a defender of the modern, you know, for all of its problems. Of the, you know, I was a net. I'd say and argue. I argued that it was kind of good for informed citizenship, the current situation. And then social media happened, which I guess we can date roughly from Facebook, which is so four or five, and then. Uh, but really, the iPhone, I mean, the, 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 mo the smartphone, I think, which just transforms everything. Uh, uh, well, the combination, I guess, of the Internet and uh, Facebook and the smartphone. So uh, the ability to access other people's thoughts and information if they wish to share it with you, or in some cases, I guess, in a funny way, if they don't. And, and then uh, you know, the immediate availability of everything. I feel like that's a different f kind of phenomenon, almost, from the more normal Gee, the journalists are being a little more, you know, more attentive to who reads what, and that's the technology. And as you say, the decrease in newsroom staff, but made up for maybe by the increase in access to a lot of other sources. That's more, all those things strike me as more half, you know, glass half full, glass half empty. Whereas I kind of feel like the social media thing is a different level of challenge to our traditional ways of thinking about citizenship. Doesn't mean it might not also turn out to be in some ways beneficial, but. I don't know. So talk about that. Some you've thought a lot about this and written a lot. Well, about I'm this. I'm I'm confused. I mean, I you know maybe start with Donald Trump, the image of a president sitting. I don't know where he sits in his bed, and mm -hmm. I don't know in the Oval Office at five six in the morning. Um, for the two and a half years I recently covered media, literally, I would watch a show like uh, from five to say five thirty Central, six six thirty Eastern, which I named. Trump and Friends on Fox, um, and I, it was clear as now has been shown. Yeah. Uh, he'd be watching it, and then he'd send out a tweet, right? Uh, or he'd be, you know, maybe stumbling into Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski mm. bashing him, and then he'd be sending sending out nasty things about him. And no matter what mainstream journalists say about. The fact that you've got to treat all this with a certain degree of, um, of uh, you know, of, of moderation and just you know, die, you know, just don't repeat everything. That the, the fact is that that every, everything becomes a story. I mean, and, and the New York Times, Washington Post, they've got people who are monitoring early in the morning, sunrise, this stuff, um, and it's sort of part and parcel of this train that's out of the station. I'm not sure what one does. Journalists as guilty as anybody in feeling compelled to tell one and all about every single thought they have on everything. I mean, they're prominent anchors who are telling me their take on the football, the Redskin football game they're watching. I don't care, mm -hmm. but they just sort of feel that their 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 views on every single thing uh, can be mentioned, and then there is the passing around of totally bogus stories. Yes, yeah, so that's a slightly different thing. Without, without that, any right. sense of responsibility. Well, this appeared here, so just FYI, that doesn't mean. And, and Trump has been caught doing this too. Right. Uh, it it doesn't mean that I am supportive of that, but it just it's it's sort but of just interesting. the pure technology of fake news. Let's use that term. Is I think it's a step even further than. I mean, Trump happens to have access to Twitter, which he wouldn't have had 10 years ago, and so he can immediately react to a story or mimic it, and then people can comment on it. That's still recognizably a president and a news media and other politicians reacting to each other. It just happens in, like, warp right. speed compared to, you know, it would have been a press release that the next day would have been analyzed by George Will and the third day would have been responded to by, you know, a Democrat and whatever. The social media fake news phenomenon is really, it strikes me, qualitatively different. I mean, you, you will talk about Mueller recently had an indictment in which he cites... Uh, Mueller had an indictment, you know, a while back, and it's of the Russians, and Russians. it's tied to the campaign. Forget the issue of, you know, which the beta... You, forget the, right, the, stuff, the yeah. substantive issue about whether Trump was, you know, somehow in, in, in league with Putin, blah, blah. For, put that aside. To me, what was very revealing about the Mueller indictment was the evidence of the Russians who were doing all this stuff, whether at Putin's behest or not, I don't know, just sort of scoffing and almost incredulous at how credulous uh, 
American consumers were about this stuff. They were putting this crazy stuff on Facebook and they were exploiting what turns out, I think, partly because of social media, to be this increasing news illiteracy. Now, this is politically incorrect, and particularly as a journalist, and we're right, supposed we're, to... We're for that in, on, this, well, uh, we're, well, on these we're, conversations. You know, you know, this is America, <laughs> great democracy, the right thing always happens, blah, 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 we're so virtuous, we go to the polls, and blah, 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 blah. But the fact is, increasingly, people don't distinguish between BS and what's legitimate. And the Russian, in the Mueller indictment at least, the Russians, are, they, they can't believe how this stuff is taking off and people aren't distinguishing. Um, and that's a real problem. With, with Facebook, you have, I think, unavoidably a tarnishing of brands. So uh, maybe now at least half, maybe more of, of the stories in the New York Times, the people reading the New York Times, they're not getting from the New York Times website, they're getting via Facebook. And I think that's good on one hand, it's, it's a greater distribution channel. Right. On the other hand, people increasingly aren't cognizant of, of a brand, where a story comes from, certainly not cognizant of the author. And if people are being deceptive, it can make it look like the National Times, you know, a fake news oh my gosh. organ that, you know, and if you spend a tiny bit of money, you can make it look like an actual news story, right? And then your aunt sends it to you, as, or like, you know, likes it, and you see it in her, on her Facebook page, whatever, and, and suddenly that thing is floating around the internet just like the actual New York Times story, right? Which is, you know, um, to get in a, a plug for my, my, my current Gig. It's it's an operation based in New York. No, we'll talk about that. Called, that called, called NewsGuard, and and two very prominent journalists, journal, media entrepreneurs, a guy named Steve Brill and a guy named Gordon Krovitz. Gordon was former publisher of the Wall Street Journal, and what we're attempting to do is sort of kind of be a consumer reports of news sites in the English language, both real and fake, and trying to give people um, a non-ideological, non-partisan. Uh, objective journalist reported uh, snapshot of who these who these sites are. Uh, now it ranges from you know NPR to something that might be called the the Denver Herald or something, which so that sounds like a newspaper, and the website kind of looks like a newspaper, but it's not. It's some crazy thing by some polemicist who's made up stuff, and but for a fair number of folks it. It may seem legitimate. Remember a few months ago, Politico had a story about a congressional candidate in Arizona heralding her endorsement by the Phoenix something. Well, that must be a new... No, it's something that, that her partisans of her made up. It's a right. phony website. So we're going to try, try to bring some sanity to all this to at least provide a place that you can go to see what wait a second, this the story that my friend Bill sent me uh, what is this site I've never heard of it a plate now are we going to change the world probably not but um, I think it's something that's needed and we're, we've got a bunch of reporters who are spending every day assessing sites and we'll 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 see what yeah, happens. Yeah, as we speak, this is just launching, so yeah. we'll see. But what it really isn't like, if I could say, I mean, quite like consumer. I don't really read consumer reports, so maybe it is. It isn't quite like consumer reports. It seems to be in this respect. Well, let's just take Yelp or something that right. we all probably use. Um, that is genuinely. I mean, leaving aside whether you can game the system and people can pay other people to write reviews, it is consumers saying this hotel was fine, this hotel room was dirty, you know, whatever. I mean. The analogy of that would be the consumers of the news rating, I guess, these sites. And which Facebook. is exactly what Facebook wants to do. Right. But you're doing something different, which is right. more like, to use the restaurant analogy, it occurs to me, I don't know, a Michelin guide or something, right. where experts are saying this is really excellent and this is sort of not quite as good. And trust us because we're, you know, rest professional restaurant reviewers or chefs. I'm not saying that's sarcastic. I, mean, I think it, it is, and honestly, I don't even know. I mean, I'm sure there are studies done on Michelin guides versus Yelp as, you know, better guides to where to go to, to dinner in, in D.C. But, but I think that's very interesting. And people haven't really, it seems to me, people haven't really thought of that yet, though, that the, oh, I don't know, I guess there's such suspicion of the mainstream media. I guess the counterargument to what you're doing is, well, this is a bunch of establishment people deciding they like establishment websites. I mean, that will be, I suppose, what... Breitbart will say, right, or something. Which, or, parenthetically, get us back to the beginning of this conversation as we're growing up on the Upper West Side. 
is a reminder of the dramatic change in popular sentiment toward mainstream media. It was sort of reflexively trusted. Now it's sort of kind of reflexively mistrusted that it can be, certainly for a guy like Trump, yeah, oh, you work for the money-losing New York Times or something like that. That's, you know, that's, um, uh, you know, a, a, a source of, uh, of, of rebuke. And so, you know, that's in the mix, too. And, and it's, it's going to be fascinating to see how we are responded to. I mean, conservatives, incidentally, I, I'm very struck by this. And I just had a conversation with my colleague Steve Hayes the other day about it. He won't mind if I repeat it, I think, which is, I mean, conservatives have been unhappy with the New York Times and mainstream media since forever. And certainly, Agnew made a big issue of it in the 70s, in 1970, I think it was. He gave those speeches. And, and you know, it's a legitimate, I mean, some of that, I would say, incidentally, some of that suspicion and criticism was probably legitimate and useful. Having said that, Steve made a point. Trump really has taken that to another level. Steve says he used to give speeches two or three years ago, and I have had the same experience. You give a speech about politics, what's going on, this, that, Iraq, <clears throat> you know, whatever, uh, health care, th this political fight, the Democrats, Republicans. And you'd get one or two questions maybe of the 10 you would take afterwards uh, f about the media. What about the media? Are they fair? Is that, what about Fox? Do you think Fox is really good? And c how does it compare? And what about how much effect does it have? Steve put it that I mean, slightly hyperbolically, three quarters of the questions now about the media. Trump for conservatives has made, I would say, more than the Democratic Party, more than President Obama, almost as much as Hillary Clinton, has made the media the enemy or the object of at least of derision, but also of suspicion. And I really, and look, I'm, I'm not against criticizing the media. I've done it myself for what it's wrong. But I mean, you do wonder at some point as a governance matter, how does this work out? I mean, you say people, we were talking about the Facebook example 10 minutes ago, and, you know, I, I got this thing, and I don't know if it's true or not, but if Trump is telling you it's all the same level. Two years ago, Pew Research, very reputable organization, uh, canvases 1,500, 2,000 Americans, uh, I, you know, self-identifying as either Democrats or Republicans. When it asked, a and most of the questions were media related, when it asked the question about do you stipulate to, do you agree that the media has a watchdog, that was the key word, watchdog role in American society, the response of Democrats and Republicans is roughly the same. It was in the 70s. A year later, the, Republic, the, the Democratic response was about the same. It actually allegedly went up one or two points. Uh, the Republican response was now went from mid-70s to the 40s. Now, how'd that happen so quick? It's got something. There's, there's a Trump factor somehow in his having been very effective in, in knocking us down. And then throw in, and, and social media played a real role here, throw in a lot of self-inflicted wounds, a lot of big high-profile mistakes that were became way more high-profile. CNN had a, a, a story they totally messed up. Some other organizations had stories they, they messed up. And as opposed to just 10 years ago, where there would, might have been a discreet little, little correction in a magazine or a newspaper, now it's all over and Trump is sending it out and saying, see, how can you trust CNN? They, they messed up this. Remember there was a Russian story. Several people were fired and they were fired right. very, very quickly. Um, and, and you had similar problems at a few other organizations and that has just fed the sense that we can't be trusted, and I don't know how you, I, I, I have, I don't know how you'd necessarily turn that around, in, certainly in a short time. I mean, time. I, as someone who's thought the media was much too nice to President Obama on a lot of issues, there's the famous Iran deal coverage, which the Obama administration itself boasted at kind of manipulating yeah, 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 yeah. stuff, and I think that's a legitimate question to ask about the mainstream media. But yeah, that's a whole different level of questioning than it's all fake or you can't believe anything or or I'm going to make up some data here and some tweet, and it's equally true. Even if, I mean, you know, I mean, the joke stuff is the largest crowd ever at the inauguration, but he says, you know, it's also true about lowest unemployment ever. Well, it's not actually or fastest growth. Look at my growth compared to Obama's. Well, it's actually about the same. And that's just a fact. I mean, GDP, these are just numbers. This is not like an interpretation. But, you know, he says something different, and I, it, you do wonder, without being too Trump obsessive here, it does seem to me that the President of the United States says it. That's new. I mean, whatever criticisms presidents made of particular but articles. But it's also and because he is able to, unfiltered. I mean, he can, 
if he went in the age before social media, went to the, the James Brady briefing room and said a bunch of these similar things every day, you know, there'd be sort of an editing process and, you know, maybe people would mention some of it, maybe they would edit other things and they would quickly juxtapose what he said with, well, that's not really true. Here, it's 5.15 in the morning on, in, in the Central Times on 6.15 and it, it's boom, 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 boom. And it, 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 it can also, it surely it, it, it can wander into his bashing actor Alec Baldwin for his impersonation of Trump. Right. I mean, it, it's, it's all over. But but the the impact is um, is is really significant. I mean, take I, I worked in recent years a lot for Vanity Fair magazine, and um, he hated the editor, Graydon Carter, and Graydon Carter, the editor, hated him. I think it goes back to when Carter was thing, yeah. editor of Spy magazine. Yeah, it was a it was a New York City pissing match, and so I've done a. I was writing every day for Vanity Fair, but I and I did one recently fairly big story in the September issue, and thank God Angelina Jolie was on the cover, so maybe a few people got into that right. issue. And it was about the New York Times, as I said, versus the Washington Post. And if Donald Trump knew, the, I, I, I don't know if he'd care, but I wish he knew the care and precision that uh, the editing process on that story. I had to go, after I finished the first draft, I had to go to the nearby Staples or Kinko's or something in Chicago. I had to make copies of every single interview I had, every single relevant email, ship it to New York, because every single sentence they said, how do you know this? Crystal said that, where, where, where does he say that? And I'd have to send the notes. And it was, it was very impressive. And it was several weeks of, of editing, and they caught some mistakes, and they said, well, no, Crystal didn't say, I believe. He said, I think. Yeah. I mean, it, it got down to that granular yeah. level. And I was truly impressed. But, you know, that's, a, that's on one hand, a, a reality that most people don't know, won't concede. And at the, uh, on the other hand, it's a reality that I think is on the decline in a lot of newsrooms because there's no room to hire. There's no money to hire editors right. to have that no, sort of... No, we do the same kind of fact-checking. It, <laughs> it, it takes time, and it's someone who's competent to sort of look up stuff or double-check. And, you know, when Chris Caldwell writes a long piece for us, he sends in the email after he sends the piece, here are my notes and citations. This you can find in, you know, this book or this article or, you know, even Wikipedia. But, I mean, it's a fact, you know, that Merkel did X in Germany and why it but it is shocking a little bit. I mean, it's a Trumpy talking point, so it's not one that I particularly like, but I will say this. It is amazing how often you walk by and look up at the screens in the airport or out of anywhere, and it's CNN, sources say, colon. And, you know, it really, at some point, you do say, it really, is this? Used to be, when I was in the White House, you I... had to argue hard to be able to go on background. You had to say, why should I let you say this without your name? Well, look, if I say it with my name, I'm going to be fired. I'm telling you something that's true, and this is like you know, inside dope from the White House, and I'm, of course, arguing from my point of view. And people would then say a senior administration official says. But it was, and there was a lot of that already in the late, or late 80s, early 90s. But even so, it was pretty limited. You certainly had to be a senior administration official or a senior White House official. And certainly the reporter would tell the editor who it was, and they might say, you know what, he's just litigating his own little agreements here. We're not going to use that. And that happened quite often, actually, and perfectly legitimately, you know. And anyway, you couldn't just get to random sources familiar with this dispute, say, or people close to Jared Kushner say, that's not like, that was not considered like, a, maybe in an exceptional case, you know, Watergate, you could get away with that. And now it is just Katie bar the door. I mean, anything can be printed with water. There used to be two sources, remember? You had to have we had two sources. Door, I mean, it was like, and now on mainstream, this is where the mainstream media hurts itself, it seems to me. I mean, this is where you can't, you know, this is not just bloggers. I mean, if CNN's going to put up stuff that one source has told them third hand about something, why shouldn't a blogger report something equally dubious? And then what's the distinction? And getting back to your, your social media questions, there's no doubt of the pernicious role that social media plays in even these editing decisions because of the competitive pressure of seeing a rival have that story. Sources say Kushner says blah, 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 blah. And then 
you, you feel you, you can't wait an hour. You can't wait. To, you, got, you, you call your person at the White House. You call your person at Treasury, wherever he or she may be, and we've got to have some, we have to have something now. And editors will deny this. They'll say, oh, no, we're as rigorous and, and contemplative. It's just not true. You talk to friends that you might have at the Post, Washington Post or New York Times, and to talk, ask them about the pressure they feel uh, right. you know, in a given hour to at least replicate somebody's story. Right. And I often find it interesting to look when a story is, quote, breaking, and you go on a you know, prominent website, take a look at the story by a reporter you may trust, and then look at that story five or six, seven hours later when he or she actually has time to do some reporting, to do some thinking. And I think there, there are marked differences. You're, you're, you're but meanwhile, every other place that is more of a clickbait, if I can say place, or just even a people just trying to have make sure the website's fresh, which even you know, we do at the Standard, of course, has, has quoted or replicated or not quoted but just stolen from the first story. So the Post person writes a, let's say, semi-respectable story. The Hill, everyone else is now churning out versions of it. And, and uh, yes, you say by the time the Post guy actually writes a more, you know, sophisticated story that's got some context and nuance and counter arguments about it wasn't that way, it's like but just, it's what, over, right? But just realize what you just said, which is totally correct, and what's implicit in it. Not too long ago, your rival broke a story. You would go out and try to independently confirm Correct. it. Correct. Now, that's gone. I'd say uh, that's still the case like at the Times Post Journal level, those three, but everyone else is gone. I don't know. Because Even, I okay. think, no, I think you'll see, bub, the story's big enough, the Post of Times will go, ba 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 ba. the Washington Post is reporting. Right. Because right. they just feel this intense pressure. It seems so quaint when I think back to being Washington bureau chief for the uh, Chicago Tribune during the Clinton era, and I remember the weekend, and you probably remember it vividly, when word leaked out, I can't remember if it was through the Drudge Report or through Jackie Judd of ABC about a semen-stained dress that weekend. Remember that weekend? And so I'm sitting in the Washington, Washington Post, I'm sitting in the Chicago Tribune Bureau on uh, G Street, uh, and for 24 hours having a debate with my bosses back in Chicago. I can't confirm that. I don't know about a, I don't have FBI sources that tell me that there was a semen stained dress. And this story is taking off. It started taking off, I think, I can't remember it was late Saturday night, but certainly by Sunday morning, and ABC and a reporter named Jackie Judd. Judd. And so we're debating this. And by that evening, and you know, there was no internet, so we didn't have any place to send anything. But by that evening, we had decided on the following, that we would mention that ABC reported this and we could not independently confirm it. That was, I think, a hint of things to come. Now, people aren't even necessarily saying we can't independently confirm. Right. They're just repeating stories that may prove to be total crap. And, and, and exaggerating, I see this quite a lot, that the initial report might be a fairly nuanced one that, uh, just saw an instance of this, which is now escaping my mind, just last night it struck me. And by the time you get to the second or third headline, and this is you know, particularly true of the more clickbaity places, it's like wildly, I think it was this one. Someone, was it this guy who worked for Trump, the lawyer, I can't remember his name right now, says he believed that Donald Tr Trump Jr. would have told his father about the Russian the Trump Tower meeting. He knows the family. He worked for them for years. Now, that's a legit interesting thing. He, this Ner Sam Nuremberg, I think it's right. his name. That's a legit, liter he said on TV, perfectly reasonable thing for someone to report. But the headlines, like an hour, I was sort of struck an hour later from some other places were, you know, Trump told his father, or, you know, source says Trump told his father. The source didn't say he knew that Trump told his father. He, at that point, I think, was on the outs with Trump and had left the campaign and stuff. It was that he believed knowing what he knew about how the family worked, which is, as I say, still legitimate as long as you report that this is this person saying it, not knowing, and just it's his assumption based on his knowledge of the family. But that, by two hours later on Twitter, is kind of, hey, Trump knew, Trump, someone who, someone knows, someone's saying, a source says that Trump Jr. told his father. And it's actually being discussed on TV in that way, you know, two hours oh. later on the different cable networks. And, and uh, I mean, it really is... And it, 
Yeah. And it covers every category of our lives. So, uh, there's a story a while back. ESPN has a story about they have learned that, according to sources, that the FBI has had a wiretap on the Ari's famous Arizona, University of Arizona basketball coach. Right. Uh, talking to some agent uh, about a hundred thousand dollar payment to the family of a, a, a potentially star high school recruit who now is star player, freshman for Arizona. Many people think he'll be the number one pick in the pro draft uh, this spring. Um, and and this, it's, sources familiar or something say that FBI has a wiretap. I, that story gets instantly repeated. Nobody has, I mean, unless you heard the FBI wiretap, which presumably even ESPN has not heard, I don't really know. The guy now totally denies it. So somebody is lying. Somebody is wrong. There's no middle ground. The guy has said it's totally, the coach has said it's totally untrue. Uh, ESPN stands by its reporting. But in the context of what we were just talking about, it led to hours and hours and hours of sports radio and sports TV discussion with the premise being that this was true. Was not the coach even, I don't know if he suspended. So one he, game, then he one, came back. Right. Then he, he came back right. with the support of the university. The player whose family supposedly got hurt, he's still playing and, you know, presumably he's going to be a star in the March Madness, blah, 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 blah. But nobody independently confirmed that. No one knows about, is there an FBI wiretap that, that exists? May, I don't know, maybe the ESPN lawyers know. Maybe they really grilled the reporter. I hope so. But to me, the, 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 the depressing thing was how quick everybody, unable to confirm it, was uh, simply right. repeated. And their, their cop-out is, well, that's out there. The story's out there. And right. people, are, people are talking about it. That's the new bar. Well, people are talking about it. And that's what happened to me that Sunday with the semen stain dress. I lost out on the argument of not running it because, quote, everybody's talking about it. And that was before the Internet. Yeah, no, that is uh, – the Internet plus social media is a pretty amazing one-two punch, which I think is a bigger change than – Maybe maybe television was as big a change, I don't know, 70 yeah. years ago. But I mean, you're talking about a once every two, three generations level now, change, I think, yeah. in the way we understand information. The, at the same time, let's not forget that to say a world in which you are very conversant in, which is academe. I mean, one no longer has – the professor no longer has to wait to some ponderous journal, which is not oh. going to come out for another year, is going to – he links to his, his stuff. And w w some of my uh, most interesting folks whose social media, whose Twitter accounts that, that I get, are really, really bright academics who, have, you know, oh, who right. smartly use right. the new technology to have interesting, they may be political science folks, they may be sociologists, they may be cultural anthropologists. I mean, uh, you, you can, and, and interestingly enough, that may also presage the decline of your traditional academic journal. Well, I think it will. And it, it also the pos positive side, and I remain to believe that there are a lot of positive sides. Stuff gets fact-checked incredibly quickly. A book comes out, it makes a little splash, it suits the partisan leanings of one side or another. But within two weeks, you have 15 intelligent blog posts, and uh, which you can find referred to then on Twitter. You don't even have to be, you don't have to personally be scouring kind of economics or history blogs. You just follow a few people who do read them. And quickly you realize, oh, this is not really good. This looked like a good academic book. It was published by Harvard University Press, but actually it's extremely problematic. So in that respect, stuff that would have taken 18 months in the old, I mean, I'm, no, it, there's, there's very much pluses and minuses, as they say, but... Uh, Anyway, well, this is a conversation that we need to continue, and especially going forward, I think, where does this all go? I mean, do you want to conclude with a thought or two on this? I mean, we, we're in the mid. Are we, let me guess, are we near the end of this process? Are we no. in the middle of it? No, are we no, in the no. Beginning? I, th I think we're sort of an early part of a transition, particularly when it comes to business models of media. Uh, I think if you had Bill Gates in here, Zuckerberg here, Mr. Brin here from uh, Google, if they were being honest, they would say they do not know where this is all going. If you certainly, if you ask the editors of lots of papers and magazines, um, 
Are you going to have a print version in five years? Is there going to be a reputable a local paper in or news organization of some sort in Peoria or Grand Rapids? I, I don't think anybody knows. I mean, that's scary. It's uh, certainly uh, fascinating. But I think for folks who are listening to us, uh, who are sort of new to all this, I don't think one should be you know, feeling guilty about, you know, thinking that you're so ignorant about it because I think only fools and the most arrogant folks around us and maybe a few genius types like, I don't know, Jeff Bezos or something have any real sense of, of, where, it's, of where it's going. And I would say on the political side, I was talking with someone very involved in the Obama 2012 campaign, which was considered state-of-the-art and was in terms of targeting and digital and so forth early days of digital, I guess, and, uh, and he said, look, I mean, it's already, we're already too, that was great, everyone wanted to imitate us for about a year. We're two generations away from that already. I mean, the, my stuff is now old fashioned, you know, where we could really target more precisely, you know, suburban women who care about X. That's like fine, everyone does that, but we're way beyond that in terms of social media. And I said to him, do you know where this goes in terms of its political implications? Would you advise a candidate running for president in 2020, uh, or local office too? So I, honestly, I think it could, we could already be a generation or two further along. And I don't know what I, you know, it might well be that you shouldn't spend any money on TV at this point. You should spend it entirely on super sophisticated Facebook targeting. Or maybe that's me looking at things the way they are now, and, I'll, and that will be totally wrong two years from now. Yeah, that's you know? fascinating. My, my bias on that is to think that you have a consultant class, many of them here, who still get rich off a percentage of TV right. buys, and it's in their self-interest to right. convince the candidate or prospective candidate that, oh, you're going to have to spend X percent right. on local television, where probably, I, I believe, by and large, you're probably getting a lot older viewers who are already set in their views. Right. They know which way they're going to vote, whether, right. you know, Democrat or Republican or, you know, the moderate or the or the, the more strident got person in the primary. So I, I, th I think that's sort of, by and large, a, a waste of money. But I think, f to me, more important than a lot of the, the media-related questions we've had is what is the impact on civic engagement? That I don't know. I think we've been naive in thinking that the technology was in and of itself a vehicle to get people more politically involved. I don't necessarily think that's true. And on that point, I'm mean, just to take, not to defend the old TV ads, which were extremely you know, vulgar and could be quite demagogic and so forth, and a huge amount of money and uh, people lining their own pockets. At the end of the day, at least one virtue of them I'd say compared to the current, and I know people who do strongly believe in Senate, they should spend a huge, much larger percentage of, I think we'll see that much more and more, people spending a higher percentage of their money on the digital stuff and less on TV. On the end, if there's a TV ad up, everyone saw it, it could be attacked and criticized and fact-checked. You could say this is demagogic. The other guy could run a response ad. And you had something like a, a public discussion. It was low level in the sense that it was 30 seconds each and it depended on emotional images sometimes, but it was still visible. The digital stuff is not visible, and you can target, and the Russians, of course, show, you can target different digital messages to every, to different, not just different groups, to different individuals, depending on their interests and issues, and that's okay. So you target the gun rights guy who's on his Facebook page is full of Second Amendment stuff, and you tell him, here's my position on guns. That's still okay, your position. But, what, but there's nothing really to stop you from th having a different gun message to the person who's more in favor of right raising the age for, for gun ownership. And maybe you'll be caught on it, but will you really be? Because no one can monitor every single thing that goes out, right? So the degree of manipulation and dissembling, I would say, uh, the degree of information goes up, and a lot of that's great, but the degree of manipulation and dissembling that can go that can be, go on, oh. really, it was hard. It used to do a direct mail. Direct mail was the kind of low, you know, from an ethical point of view, the lowest level, because you could send different mail to the suburban moderates uh, outside Chicago and to the right. rural, you know, uh, true believers in gun rights, you still might get caught because the mail was kind of sitting around and some reporter might be on a mailing list, you know. But now with digital stuff, you can really target in a way that's... You want to you get a, 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 a couple of blocks that you believe are uh, heavily Jewish with the claim that uh, candidate A is an anti-Semite? Yeah, you can do yeah. that. And do and you ever get caught, really? Does it, ever, does it ever get tracked back to you if you have some cutout who sends out that stuff? No, right? But then what 
what happens? But especially with uh, the decline of the local media, who is sort of the watchdog? Who yeah. is sort of an arbiter? I mean, it's why my fingers are crossed that this, this new venture that I'm involved in called NewsGuard can have some positive impact, but it's not going to get to that level of you know, of, of, of political races where people are effectively slinging mud at one another. And by the time it's already out, by the time thousands have already seen it, and maybe it's targeted to a couple of blocks on their, on ESPN. I mean, because right. you, you, can, you can slice it that much. You can slice it to, you know, your CNN or, you know. Uh, well, feed. you can just slice it to websites. And I mean, it's, it's a Facebook page, isn't a Google search, which really is hard to track. Right? Yeah, so. so I don't know. I mean, um, the, uh, I think it's ultimately absolutely, maybe my final thought is it's absolutely wonderful that the number of gatekeepers that we knew when we grew up in the Upper West Side of Manhattan has dramatically expanded. It's also a problem that there's sort of kind of no gatekeepers and you have this kind of wild west, I think by and large, by and large healthy democratization of the media, but at the same time, as there's more great stuff out there than ever before in human history, there's more unadulterated crap. That's an appropriately <laughs> no, cautious and ambivalent, I think, s serious note to uh, to end on. It's you know, democracy is more democracy is both good and bad, and this isn't the only instance of that. But this yeah. is maybe a particularly striking instance and a particularly fast changing one, which is why we'll have to get together at a yeah. year or two and see, see what both how your happening. project is going yeah. and see really honestly what's happening. So you do have the sense that if we talk in two years, it's going to be different from today. I don't think it's just going to be more of the same either. These things go, can take off in pretty dramatic ways. Do you think, final question for you, in your world, print publications, will there be prominent ones who are not here in two years? Yes. The, yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 I know there's talk about magazines that we that have been around for a lot longer than the Weekly Standard stopping being print publications. So that's just one thing. Now there, at least there'll be a digital publication that presumably will be similar. But uh, the social media stuff is just a whole different level of, I think, of, of uh, disaggregating and disassembling and change, which, is, as you said, could be for the better and well, will be for the better and for the worse. And the question is then how to how to deal with it as a functioning liberal democracy. But knock on wood, we have thoughtful, long-form podcasts <laughs> as one of the and new species that we haven't spoken about. Yeah, that's about. true. And, uh, we should, we'll talk more about that next time. Right. And yes, right. hopefully we're doing our little bit. Jim Warren, thanks so hey, much Kelly, for, for, for joining me here. Pleasure. Uh, and thank you for joining us on Conversations. Yeah.